Take your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, forasmuch as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our suffi sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that with re which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is to be done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and when the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And verse 18 is the verse I want to focus on tonight. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. I want to talk tonight about the ability to change provided by the new covenant. The ability to change provided by the new covenant. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for everything you've done for us. I thank you for this chance I have to share what you've shared with me. I pray that you'll help me to clearly, clearly say what you have on my heart, uh, clearly dictate it. I pray that you'll be with me here tonight. I submit myself to you. I pray that you'll teach me out of this, God, and help me to be an encouragement to others tonight. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, this, this chapter is an excellent discourse on the superiority of the New Covenant over the Old Covenant, also known as the Old and New Testaments. And the Old Testament is the covenant God made with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. It was the law that God gave to Israel. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, and verse 21, no, Galatians 4, sorry. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21 says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who is of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. 
So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, God gave the old covenant, or the law, to show man that he was not capable of living in a way that would get him to heaven or would please God. Um, that was the premise of the old covenant. You could only be saved through, through the law if you kept the law in its entirety for your whole life. James 2.10, James chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So you could keep the law for your whole life, except for at one point if you messed up, you were guilty of breaking the law, and you deserved punishment, death for that. Um, so the problem with this quickly becomes apparent. No human has ever, ever been able to keep the law in its entirety except for one man, and that's Jesus. Jesus, who is 100% God and 100% man, was the only man who was tempted and yet did not break God's law. In Hebrews ch chapter 4 and verse 15, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, For we have not an high priest, I'm talking about Jesus here, for we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. So Christ was the only man who was tempted and yet did not break God's law. And for this reason, when Jesus died on the cross, he was not paying for his own sin as any other man would have been. But he was paying for the sins of all the world. Um, so through his death and his resurrection, Jesus was able to establish the new covenant, which is based on grace and not on works. Because Christ paid for our sin, we no longer have to... We, we, know, we can't earn our salvation, but the, Christ paid for our sin, thus allowing God to extend grace to us. If we accept Christ's payment and his grace, we can go to heaven. Um, and that's not saying that people under the old covenant could not be saved. If they believe on the Messiah or Christ, that the law and the prophets were pointing towards that would pay for their sin, they too could be saved by grace, just as we are. Um, they had a promise from the very beginning, before the law even was given, that Christ would defeat Satan. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, Genesis 3.15, God says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So they had a promise even before the law was given, that a, the Messiah would be given to defeat Satan ultimately. And we have a promise through the new covenant that Christ has already defeated Satan. In Colossians chapter number 2 and verse 13, Colossians 2.13 says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Did you notice that's past tense? Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. He has our, Christ has already defeated defeated Satan when he died on the cross. He defeated sin. He defeated the grave. Um, so Christ has already defeated Satan. And if we will accept, if we will believe on him, we can enjoy that victory that he has promised us. So following the old covenant or the law provided no real lasting change in a person's life. It was, if you were trying to follow the law, you're putting on a set of outward, a set of outward uh, behaviors. There's behavior modification um, that then really change your life. Uh, but the new covenant allows for real, lasting biblical change in a person's life once you've received Christ as your Savior, because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us to to change us as we submit to Him. And so I want to look from 
2 Corinthians 3.18, I want to look at this change that is provided by the new covenant. And I'm, for, the first thing I want to notice is that true, lasting, biblical change is possible. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. He said we're changed into the same image. So the glass that we behold the glory of the Lord in, that's God's word here. We are able to behold the glory of the Lord through his word. He's revealed himself to us. And if we will, will look in that glass will behold his glory uh, and ask him to teach us through it, not just read it, but ask him to teach us and mold us and change us. We can be changed. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to be like Christ. We can be growing to be more and more like Christ um, as here on this earth, and that is possible through his grace, only through his grace. Um, James chapter 1 James chapter 1, in verse 23, says, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the only way to have true, true inward change in our lives is to be in the Word of God, being taught out of the Word of God, applying it to our lives, being real about it, not just reading through our Bible in a year just to check it off a list, not just reading, any, reading it just to read it, but really studying it, applying it to our lives, being taught by the Spirit of God. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Corinthians is a... Is written Corinthians was written to a group of carnal Christians who Paul was rebuking for not growing in the Lord they were carnal they were babes in Christ second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things all things are become new so God is clear in his word that he doesn't want us to be the same as we were. If we trust him, he wants us to be changing, to be growing. Um, but how, come, how many people are, are the same as they always were? They're content just to be who they are, not to, be, not, to, not to seek out what God wants them to be, just to you know, go with the flow. This is who I am. This is how God made me is an excuse. But no, that's, God made you. But sin corrupted you, and God wants you to be changing to be who wants you to be who He wants you to be, to be a new creature. All things are become new. Romans chapter twelve. Romans chapter twelve and verse one. Romans twelve one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, true transformation, true change, only comes after we have presented ourselves to God, after we have submitted ourselves to God and and let him control our lives and be like, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I want. Um, and that's when we can truly change our lives to be the person God wants us to be. Um, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what does it mean to renew your mind? Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22 says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness and so we can't go from put off and put on the new man and and skip 
verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Amen. To be renewed means to change your mind. Amen. And it doesn't, say, it doesn't say renew your mind. It says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So how we are renewed in the spirit of our mind is we get in God's word and we find out what he says about if we're struggling with an issue, we need to get in God's word. We need to ask him to teach us. We need to find out what God says about that particular issue. And then we need to, to confess that we have been wrong and we need to agree with what God says and apply it to our lives. Um, so we are changed as we are renewed. We're transformed as we are renewed in the spirit of our mind. Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn born among many brethren. And this verse is not talking about... Um, God electing people to salvation. God chooses some and he chooses others to not be saved. Um, this is talking about God knows who's going to get saved. And he, he, those who do get saved, he predestinates them to become like Christ. And the question is, how, how willing are we going to be to conform? You know, in heaven, we will be like Christ. But here, are we going to allow God to change us to be like Christ? Um, he, pre he wants us to be conformed to the image of Christ, his son. Um, in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Um, so we've looked at a lot of verses tonight that make it clear that God wants us to change, that change is possible. Um, we don't have to live the same as we always have. We, we don't have to live under the power of sin. We can truly change our lives and live for the glory of God. Um, we can be changed into the, into the same image from glory to glory. And secondly, true lasting biblical change is only possible if we are willing to submit to the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And open here, with open face, open means ready to hear or receive what is offered. So when we're reading God's word, we can't just be reading it. I've already said this, but we can't just be reading it. But we got to read, we got to study it with a mind that is open to what God teaches us out of it. Not just reading it with our preconceived ideas of what it says, but actually looking at what it says, what it really says, and uh, asking God what it means in our lives. Um, we have to submit to what he teaches us. And the word submit means to yield, resign, or surrender to the power, will, or authority of another. To yield one, one's opinion to the opinion or authority of another. To be subject. To acquiesce in the authority of another. And acquiesce means to rest satisfied or apparently, or apparently satisfied or to rest without opposition and discontent usually implying, implying previous opposition, uneasiness, or dislike, but ultimate compliance or submission. So we were all in opposition to God at some point. There is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. Uh, Isaiah 53.6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. So before we were saved, we were in opposition to God. We were in our thinking in our own our own worldly thought processes instead of God's thought processes. Um, but often, when a person gets saved, though they're God's child, they are still in opposition to God on many issues because they haven't learned what God says about those issues. 
they are still opposed to God, and often that's ignorance, but it's still opposition to God. But it really becomes a problem when we learn what God says and still choose to oppose God. That's rebellion, and you cannot change and grow in the Lord when you're in rebellion against God. Um, if we want to grow, then at some point we have to lay, our, lay aside our opposition to God, our rebellion against him, and choose to agree with what he says in his word. And that is what submission is. God says one thing, and I say, okay, God, even if I don't like it. You know, there's, there's lots of things in God's word we may not like because it, it points out the ugliness of our lives, the sin in our lives, and it shows us that we're going to have to put some effort in and change. But even if we don't like it, we have to submit to it if we want to grow and be God's kind of person. So biblical change can only take place in our lives if we submit to what God says in the Bible. James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter 5, 5. Says, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of ye be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Submission is humility. It's it's saying, God, you are higher than I am. I'm down here, and whatever you said, whatever you say. I'm yours. I'm yours to do with what you want. Um, he, Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 9 says, Hebrews 12, 9, Furthermore, have we had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? So we, we honor our dads. Most of us we love our dad. We respect our dad. Now, I, I love my dad a lot. He, and he corrected me a lot growing up. I had a lot of correction. <laughs> and you know what? I, I respect my dad a lot. I love him. And how much more should I respect my heavenly father and honor him? Um, Second Chronicles 30 and verse 8. Second Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 8 says, Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary which he has sanctified forever and serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. And the word yield is another word for submit. Um, if they were in... It says that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Uh, this was uh, when Hezekiah was king, and Israel had been, you know, serving other gods, but Hezekiah was, was bringing them back to the Lord. And God had been angry with them for, for forsaking him, but he still said, if you will yield yourself to me, I'll turn the fierceness of my wrath from you. So it's never too late to change. You know, you may, be, you may feel like you've gone too far. You know, I, I am who I am. I can't change. But God says you can change if you will yield to him. Um, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 in verse 3. I love this verse. Romans 10, 3. Talking about the children of Israel. It says, for they being ignorant of, of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So we have to throw out what we think is righteous and submit ourselves to what God says is righteous in his word. We can have preconceived ideas of what we think is right and what is wrong, um, but if we're not going to the Lord and asking him what is right and what is wrong, 
uh, then we are going then we are going about in our own righteousness in self-righteousness and we're not submitting to the righteousness of God um, Isaiah chapter 57 Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. If we want revival in our heart, if we want to truly change, then we need to humble ourselves before God and submit to him. So true lasting biblical change is possible, but it's only possible if we're willing to submit to the Lord. And then lastly, true lasting biblical change is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, we can't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. We have to understand his, his purpose in our life. Um, and back in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Um, Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. Romans fifteen thirteen. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope, through the power, through the power of the Holy Ghost. So, if we want to have hope and joy and peace, if we want to be God's kind of person, then we have to live in the power of the Holy Ghost. Um, Romans chapter eight. In Romans chapter seven was where Paul was saying, uh, "For that which I I." Do I allow not for that which I would that I do not? He found the two members warring, the flesh against the spirit. Um, in chapter 8, he finds the answer. And it's, uh, there is there, in chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace." Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not, have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Galatians. Galatians 5 and verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, witchcraft hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And those are all possible in the life of a Christian, not walking in the Spirit. Um, and such like, 
Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Um, Ephesians 5.18 Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then the last verse in this section, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Quench not the Spirit. So if we want to change in our lives, if we want to be God's kind of person, then we have to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to submit to the Spirit in our lives. God gave us this Holy Spirit for a reason. He, he gave the Spirit as our comforter, and he also changes us as we submit to him. He, he teaches us through God's word. Um, this, the Bible is a spiritual book that we can't understand with our carnal mind. Um, the Holy Spirit has to teach it to us um, I believe 1 Corinthians 2 talks about that, or 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2. Um, says, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And it goes on to talk about how the natural man cannot receive the things of God. He can't understand them, um, but the Spirit teaches us. Um, so if we want to change, we have to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have to be in fellowship with the Spirit of God, um, which means dealing with our sin, uh, asking him, is there any sin that stands between me and you, and confessing it and repenting of it so that the way is clear for him to teach us. Um, and we can cl clearly hear his teaching. So, change, true lasting biblical change is possible, but it is only possible if we are willing to submit ourselves to God and to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, it said, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary through the Bible, he tells a story about a little boy who lived in a village where there's a mountain with a rock formation, which they called the Great Stone Face. The people had a legend that someday someone would come to the village who would look like the Great Stone Face. He would do wonderful things for the village and be a means of great blessing. That story really took hold of the little boy, and he would gaze at the Great Stone Face at every opportunity he had, and would dream at the time someone looking like the great stone face would come to the village. Years went by, and the little boy became a young man, then an old man. He was tottering down the street one day when someone looked up and saw him coming and shouted, He has come! The one who looks like the great stone face is here! He, uh, he had gazed at the great stone face for so long that now he bore its image. And so if we want to be Christ-like, if we want to grow to be like Christ, we must spend time looking at Jesus. He has revealed to us through his word, so we need to be in the word of God looking at Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full on his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So Christ paid for our sins on the cross. He reconciled us to God through his blood. And if we will submit to God, and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be changed into his image. And so the question tonight is, are you changing? Or have you found yourself stagnant in your Christian life? And if you are stagnant, you're actually going backwards, and you'll be destroyed in your life. If you're not growing, you're dying. And so God wants us to be his kind of person, to constantly be growing into the person he would have us to be. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for, thank you for help, helping me with this message. I pray that... It was a help to people tonight. I pray that if anyone here needs to be needs saved tonight, I pray that you convict them of their need for you.
trust you as our Savior. Because change is only possible if we believe in you. Uh, and I pray that if there is anyone here who is saved but has wondered and needs to be growing in you, that you would help them to grow.